so good afternoon dear friends on behalf of the department of english university of golconda this is amit bhattacharya your host for the session welcoming you to another session of the online lecture series that we are organizing we are indeed very very pleased to have in our midst professor ashok k mahapatra from shambalpur new university and today he is going to deal with the construction of mother tongue the cultural construction of mother tongue and he will focus on the roles of colonialism colonial culture on the one hand and translation on the other so we all know that language is a very very problematic domain because it encompasses a lot of politics the politics of categorization as well as the politics of nomenclature so we have long uh, come a very long way from first language to native language to arterial language and then obviously vernacular and mother tongue all these words all these categories all these names are all ideologically very very thick so i hope today professor mahapatra is going to talk about these things in greater detail and when i was talking to him this particular topic came up for our discussion and seeing she has already professor mahapatra has already written an article on an allied subject i felt very very interested and that's why we have thought of presenting today's session and this discussion so without further ado let me now hand over the reins of this program to the capable hands of professor ashok k mahapatra it's over to you sir okay thank you um i'm i'm delighted as well as humbled for this uh, platform provided to me by professor amit bhattacharya my friend and uh, it's a pleasure to talk to the uh, colleagues as well as students of gorbongo university and there are many others also uh, i wish to share some of my ideas about uh, the mother tongue the politics and the cultural process through which a mother tongue is created and uh, i'll be talking about the cultural construction of mother tongue and colonialism and translation and my uh, point of reference would be odia that however wouldn't mean that i would be talking about odia only to the exclusion of uh, any other language in fact all these indian mother tongues or the indian modern indian languages probably have undergone the same process of cultural construction and they all have been products of a certain consciousness i would say a translational consciousness many people talk about post colonial uh, literature and post colonial consciousness of which i guess uh, translational consciousness is a vital point which has scarcely been addressed by linguists uh, and and And, and and literary scholars which i'll be talking about um uh i wish to uh you disabuse our minds of certain popular notions in fact language is a field where we have lots of such uh, wrong notions which uh, we uh, accept uncritically and uh, we hardly have any 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 scope to reflect upon them the reason being that each one of us thinks that he or she knows everything about the language because he or she is a language speaker anyway um uh, mother tongue is one such a uh, uh, much confused and creating a uh, term uh, it is highly affective it is it is it is it is it is thought to be a very organic concept with high affective value probably like uh, the mother herself as self evident as the mother and uh, it is but but the thing is that i wish to uh, say that uh, this actually is a um a a a um product of what i call just now translational consciousness and it is mediated through uh, a certain colonial culture first of all i wish to um 
prove that uh, it is uh, commoditized as a cultural and symbolic capital on which literacy and literariness, literacy and literariness, both are predicated. And these constitute uh, what we call cultural nationalism of a certain people. Um, we never called ourselves uh, literate before the concept of mother tongue came into being. This is a uh, um, uh, well, uh, a historical uh, truth, uh, but a very strange kind. People in the 15th and the 16th century, well, their notion of literacy probably was very different from the notion of literacy we have, particularly in the post-print culture is in the oral uh, culture. People really didn't have this notion of uh, uh, illiteracy versus literacy. This is, as everybody knows, we at least know, we students of English literature, that it's a post-printer culture phenomenon. And um, uh, what is still more important is that we never identified ourselves either as Bengalis or Odias on the on the basis of the language that we spoke, what I'm trying to say is that, well, we were never, never, I mean, identity politics was was never part of the world where we lived. We were just human beings. I mean, we were never conscious or self-conscious about our linguistic or cultural identity. All these, once again, are, I would uh, try to show in this paper, are um, part of the uh, post-colonial uh, phenomenon, you know. And uh, uh, I, uh, uh, well, I guess uh, I would be showing uh, the uh, slide. Mother tongue. So we have certain popular misconceptions, as I was telling you, it's not biological and natural like mother's milk. It's not originary. It is not epistemically self-evident as the mother, perhaps. So what is it then? It is a cultural construct embedded in colonial power structure. It is a product of translation. It's a commodity in the colonial and post-colonial cultural economy. Okay, now, well, that is what I want to say. And uh, any study, any study, um, of uh, translation from the Indian languages into English or vice versa, un, uh, you know, uh, uh, necessitates unpacking the uh, the, uh, the, I, uh, the 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 term Indian languages. So what I'm trying to say, obviously, will be uh, pertinent to Oriya. I will discuss the cultural process of emergence of Odia as a modern Indian language or a mother tongue, uh, focusing on the shift, shift from Desoja uh, to Tadvaba, uh, Desoja and Tadvaba register to the Sanskritic Tatsama register with regard to um, uh, a particular word, a particular word, I'll focus on that, and that is um, Kokila, well, in Bangla it is Kokil and Koili, this is an Odia word for the Bangla equivalent is Koil. Now, I will be talking about the shift in the register. I mean, uh, it's kind of a shift of the register from the uh, I'm sorry, uh, Desaja and Tadvaba, that is Koili from uh, Kokil. That's precisely what I'll be doing. And through this, I'll be uh, uh, reflecting upon and showing a huge cultural and ideological shift that was that took place um, through uh, the period of uh, uh, through 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 uh, uh, the, uh, through uh, let's say uh, cultural I'm um, sorry uh, through um, uh, the colonial period and 
these actually are part of a larger change that took place in uh, the colonial culture uh, with regard to language. Um, let me once again go back to what I mean by, well, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, what I mean by this uh, 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 so terms in respect of the, the Indo-Aryan languages, all Indo-Aryan languages, and we have three categories. Uh, is the slide visible to you? Yes, sir. Okay, these are the words in the vocabulary of a language which are indigenous. And tad bhava, tat bhava, that's the etymology in Sanskrit words in the vocabulary of a language that are derived from a Prakrit language. All Indian Indo-Aryan languages actually have uh, grown out of some Prakrit. And if we talk about Oriya and, uh, and Bangla, both actually are cognate languages in the sense both have emerged from uh, 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 Eastern Prakrit, that is uh, Eastern Magdi, that's the Prakrit. Although um, in course of centuries, these have actually become uh, different from uh, each other, but they do have uh, a Prakritic origin. All right. And that sama words in the vocabulary of a language that are loan words from Sanskrit. So that's what it is. These are basic terms which we ought to actually um, um, be familiar with and that's why. All right. Now, mm, any study, as I told you, of translation from Indian languages into English or vice versa necessitates the unpacking of the word Indian languages into various vernaculars and Indian mother tongues. That's why um, um, we need to talk about all these. And this is because both concepts point towards a cultural shift uh, not only from orality to literacy and also uh, from pre-print to print literacy, as in our case, which made possible as a colonial capitalist economy came in to being and it replaced an earlier pre-capitalist subsistence economy. I actually am using very broad categorical terms to differentiate between the pre-colonial times and the colonial times. Well, everybody knows how actually colonialism, you know, has its own template of industrial economy and a capitalist economy. And, uh, you know, those who talk about the rise of empire do have to talk about the rise of an imperial capital which actually migrated overseas and and so on that's a very long narrative what i'm trying to say is that well when we talk about um, colonialism at least we do talk about certain kind of capitalism and i would say it's a cultural capitalism because we students of literature and humanities do talk about cultural capitalism and uh, as a consequence what happens is that uh, the native tongue or vernacular became standardized to be become a mother tongue here i wish to draw the attention of people that generally you know, in a very non-critical way uh, we use uh, the vernacular um, uh, well in exchange with the modern Indian languages, but vernacular also was the standard term of expression of the colonial masters uh, while they were referring to the tongues of the natives. A native spoke the vernacular, whereas uh, the colonial master spoke the Queen's English. And I will, in fact, take up this particular expression and broaden its theoretical scope a little later. Um, Mother tongue, you know, despite its originary overtones, uh, like the mother is very originary for us, uh, uh, it is a cultural product of standardization and uh, translation. Both are necessary. 
when a particular language, whatever be its status, when it becomes the mother tongue, actually gets standardized. All the MILs or modern Indian languages that we talk about actually are standardized versions. And standardized JSON is a, a very political and cultural process for any language, be it Bangla or Hindi or Odia or any other, you know, Indian language that we can think of. Um, mother tongue, despite therefore its originary overtones, is, uh, is, 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 is a standardized product and anything that is standardized has a very hegemonic oh you know uh, the hegemonic notions of literacy purity refinement um it's a kind of elitism all these are embedded in this whole notion of the mother tongue so it's not as innocuous as uh, or as originary as biologically given as it appears to be well the relation of English um, with uh, uh, Indian languages is extremely fraught as the former exercises its cultural authority over the later ones and influences them. And uh, the power relation is best understood through the prism of translation. Well, I will now talk about a brilliant, uh, a very long story. Uh, it is called Translate or Translated. Could we move on to um, the next slide, please, Gaurav? Yeah. And uh, Translator, Translated. And this is, oh, well, it is from um, the novel Artist of Disappearance, uh, which Anita Desai, is, uh, it came out in 2000. 11 and there is this story translator translated well you can you can read because uh, not many may have read that so i have given very brief uh, translator translated and here what you want to say how this prema this young odia academic teaching english in a delhi college believes that uh, she has been cut off from her own culture um in delhi you know uh, Odias are professionally, they have occupied very high positions, but you know, somehow Odias, uh, probably the only, only, only uh, people uh, than the other Indians who actually do not flaunt their cultural identity so aggressively as the others. But, and this girl actually has lost her mother and she, well, thinks that she has lost her cultural moorings and she wants to translate the Odia stories of one uh, writer, Subodna Devi, uh, into English. And she's very happy about it as she feels that, uh, uh, you know, uh, her discovery of this writer on the part is part of her search for the mother tongue which was lost to her after her mother died when she was a young child thereafter she never lived in Odisha and she came to Delhi and she settled there now one might say at a very simplistic level it's all about the search for one's identity well through the mother tongue and so on it's kind of a uh, uh, re uh, reconnecting herself to the lost mother, at least at the discursive level, and so on, and this search is moti motivated not to, not simply to compensate uh, for the cultural and psychic loss she has suffered on account of the mother's death, but also to carve out a niche for herself in the academia. That's very interesting. Like many English teachers, well, find it very, very, uh, very. Uh, I would say. Uh, expedient, uh, very academically expedient to take up uh, 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 translating some uh, works, some some works of their own literature, the literature which they, uh, you know, you know uh, well, uh, which is their own, and uh, translation or, you know, uh, that becomes, from the career point of view, well, this translation agenda becomes very academically expedient. We know many of our, our friends and colleagues are into it in a big way and they earn a very big uh, name and it's much easier perhaps to earn a big name that way than to be a solid scholar, literary scholar to be published in Harvard and Columbia University Press. I mean, that's, that's, that's very few of us 
can dream of. Okay, that's another matter. But why should she be translating into English? That's the question, and a very important question. Well, English uh, is uh, is is uh, evidently a uh, far richer uh, and institutionalized language, and uh, well, it it is a, it is a it has a high premium, you know, and uh, um, at least uh, it is a highly valued uh, cultural capital compared to Odia. Odia is nothing because very best of Odia writers, unless they are translated, are hardly known to the non Odias outside. And that's the, that's the, unfortunately, that's that's the situation in India, this kind of a post Babel, you know, situation that exists in India. And uh, and problem is why English? That's the whole thing. Uh, it is metropolitan and uh, a mediator among the tongues, unintelligible to each other in this post colonial Babel, as I said, and uh, Prema and it has very high uh, market value as a literary production and Prema affirms all this through her unconscious imitation of the elegance, suavity and smartness of Tara. Well, Tara obviously is non-Odia, whereas this, this woman is Odia. And uh, this Odia woman thinks that she is not very smart, although Tara and Prema both were classmates, they were schoolmates, actually, their career paths differed, she chose to be an academic, whereas Tara moved into journalism and mass communication, and she's very suave, in a very swanky office, she runs a uh, publishing house and things like that. And uh, Prema is not merely gravitating towards this idea of translating into, uh, I mean, uh, the stories of, uh, uh, well, uh, this lady into, uh, into, into English, but also, uh, but also towards Tara, and she starts imitating Tara, the head of the publishing house in Delhi. In a way, she is a kind of a mimic woman, and uh, as uh, Robert Young would say, uh, she is uh, actually uh, a kind of uh, mimic woman, and uh, she uh, is uh, uh, someone actually. Uh, well, in in the words of Robert Young, she has already been translated. When I choose to translate something into English, I have been already ontologically translated. Robert Young uh, extends the, 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 the meaning of this word translation to ontology. It's not just language. It's not just about uh, translating from one language into another, but also in ontological terms, I am getting translated myself. And that happens to Prima, who is herself translated. But, you know, there are a lot of other complications, and I wish to use this story as a classic post-colonial fable to talk to you about mother tongue and, you know, translation. And this story, in fact, provides me a brilliant entry into the field of discussion which I wish to engage myself with. Okay. Um, on the face of it, the story uh, seems to um, credit creative writing uh, in the mother tongue with the originality. Because, you know, towards the end of the story, she says that, well, while she was trying to, while she was trying to translate into English, the original language, she felt the power of it. At times, she was overwhelmed with the untranslatability of the native uh, language, which most translators in their preface or introduction talk about how they were kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, bewildered, ov overwhelmed with the power of the original. So she feels and she confesses that Odia has a greater power over her and uh, while uh, you know, translating. 
and uh, she discovers that she has written all these months under the influence of Subhadna Devi, well, the, the, the lady whom she was trying to translate. Okay, on the face of it, uh, this high uh, seems to credit creative writing in the mother tongue with originality and primacy uh, that the translation can never have since the translator is already translated, I was telling you. But being translated, Prima, comes to realize the untranslatability of the many parts of her proposed writing and acknowledges that she is helplessly caught between English and the mother tongue. At a deeper level, the story, however, uh, offers us insights into the power structure of the cultural economy of uh, translation of Oriya, or for that matter, any language into English, uh, through which uh, Prema uh, uh, quote unquote claims I would uh, emphasize claims Subhadna Devi as a protege, as a trophy. You know, in fact, she uses a certain phrase, and I would like to quote that she was as if Subhadna Devi was a camouflaged bird which she spotted, a camouflaged speckled bird, and she quote unquote discovered like a photographer perhaps you know discovering this uh, unknown bird look at the imagery of an unknown writer as a bird a camouflaged bird and she discovers as the english translator so the mother tongue embodied by subhadna devi has also been discovered by this english educated uh, uh, girl. So the story, as I told you, is some kind of a post-colonial fable, a moment of defining the need for the mother tongue, and that's precisely from where the story starts, the need to define what the mother tongue is, and it's coeval with the, 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 uh, the moment when the English educated native discovers that she or he has been colon colonized and translated, and that also comes to her consciousness that, that she is translated. But the moment in question is far more complex than it is first thought for the mother tongue actually doesn't exist a priori as if it exists a priori and waiting to be quote unquote discovered waiting to be salvaged and restituted uh, after a spell of linguistic and cultural amnesia it's never like that it's not a moment of return to one's roots which many writers talk about rather the mother tongue itself is constructed through cultural shifts from uh, from academic commoditization of the vernacular in the colonial power structure and market economy Gaurav, could you please move on to the next slide please yeah Actually, we all play this post-colonial politics of nostalgia as academics and translators in the metropole. From a privileged position, many of us invest in the world left, world left behind sentiments of nostalgia and exoticism to capital on it in the post-colonial discursive space as writers and critics and this prima is no different from them although she is pretty much in delhi and not abroad but in such case what happens is that home and mother tongue are constructed through a uh, performative and equiture in the post structuralist sense well um uh, you know i'll not be talking about home but um, the mother tongue certainly actually so uh, nostalgia what what i want to say is that nostalgia is not always a matter of pain although we know etymology of nostos and uh uh and and algia ray you know uh, uh well um that is the part of the pain of home you know so this pain is not there at times you know it seems to be some kind of a posure you know someone pretty much very well ensconced in the comforts of the Western world, only talks about, you know, the home left behind. Why don't you come here? 
and live with us like us you know so that is once again a certain field of post colonial literature which you know always uh, despite its brilliance theoretical brilliance to me at least you know it 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 always uh, you know gives a false note it always rings a false note so i i would much rather say that it's a it's a, it's kind of a politics uh, which many people indulge in and here it's it, it, it you know um, home and mother tongue as i said actually are constructed through performatives well translation is one such discursive performative and uh, and, and also it's an Ecriture, as I told you, ecriture, um, the writing, you know, in a, a deconstructive uh, sense as a kind of a deference and uh, so on. And uh, yeah, so what I'm trying to say is uh, that uh, we need to understand how this whole idea of mother tongue comes up. It is nothing to be sentimental about or to be nostalgic about because it is uh, it is it is a very 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 uh, 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 very very uh, complex as well as very subtle kind of a cultural process. Well, as the shift from orality to literacy takes place, um, uh, the vernacular actually is. Uh, converted into, transformed into uh, mother tongue. That's my central thesis. Now, you might raise your eyebrows, what the hell is he talking about? And vernacular, everybody knows that the vernacular is the same as the modern Indian language, is the same as the mother tongue of someone. And, well, we have the uh, in the in the eighth schedule, well, so many of these languages have been listed as modern Indian languages. But I would say that well, the mother tongue has emerged from a vernacular base, and that will be only only clear if we talk about what exactly a vernacular. Uh, could you please move on to the next one, please, my dear? God, I'm, I'm talking to you. Could we have the next slide? Vernacular. I would say a vernacular redefined, and that's how, actually, I would like to explain to you what it is. Vernaculum, Latin, homegrown, homebred, homespun, well, homemade, goods or slaves. One's donkey and cattle and the pre-modern world, particularly in a subsistence economy, uh, actually was called vernaculum uh, or, ver you know, and as opposed to what is obtained in formal exchange in a relatively modern uh, commodity intensive economy. Well, this actually is uh, the, uh, the central idea of Ivan Illich who actually isn't read much uh, by our scholars, but actually, uh, could you please move on to the next one and we'll come back to this again. Uh, the next slide, please. Vernacular values, which he wrote in 1980, Ivan Illich. And uh, he talks about changes in linguistic ideology in the context of an emergent nation state and what language policies does a nation state need for its self-affirmation, self-legitimation? This is a question that actually this book poses. And he also says that the modern nation state needs other than a vibrant market economy, a cultural economy for language to be marketed as a commodity. Well, this is a brilliant point that he's making. In fact, we'll be elaborating this. This is what he said with regard to Spain, one of the early colonizing empires. Well, uh, and Britain, of course, took over a little later, but 1492, that is late 15th century, and we have seen, well, uh, uh, Columbus, you know, going out in search of the, uh, uh, America. And yeah, could we go to the previous one? Yeah, right. So it is Roman scholar Marcus uh, Terentius Varro in the um, 
who lived uh, in the uh, you know fifth, first century BC extended the original meaning of vernaculum to the from the context of economy to that of language. So you know, let's talk a little about it. In any uh, subsistence economy, actually in subsistence economy, we grow things for our own survival. We don't market them. One might say it's a P capitalist kind of economy where if I grow uh, oil seeds, I exchange it in 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 in, in lieu of or I, I I give it to someone in lieu of clothes that I need for myself and the clothes are woven by somebody else. So it's kind of a barter exchange, it's a kind of a primitive pre-capitalist uh, uh, vernacular economy where what is soul is our own stuff, the stuff that we grow at home rather than something that we buy from market. So market, uh, capitalist economy, modernity, empire are in fact coeval. And what happens is, well, vernacular, which is the adjective there, language after Varro extended the this whole idea of vernaculum from from uh, commodities, I'm sorry, from, from homegrown uh, goods and slaves. Slaves were also vernacular. Wow. And uh, very interestingly, when uh, the English uh, people talk about the languages of the natives as vernacular, well, they don't so much mean slaves, but they do certainly mean the subaltern, you know, people whom we own, perhaps. The natives are your own and you have to control them. That is one of the crudest uh, well, forms of uh, uh, colonialism. Well, any language available at home and learned or acquired free of cost, as opposed to language grown elsewhere and learned, bought for a price as a commodity. Look at this. Vernacular is something that we learn at home. It's available, it's homegrown. It's part of uh, our cultural growth for which well, we don't have to pay a price. Well, we, we, we conflate this with mother tongue. In fact, as we will see, mother tongue is something that we go out for to schools and from where we buy them for a price. Could you please? move on to the next slide. Could you please? Well, the empire and the standard language, that's right. The empire and the standard language. And uh, uh, well, uh, that happens when Columbus, you know, made this discovery and uh, just about three months later in Spain, well, there was somebody else doing something while Columbus was out on the sea to discover a whole continent uh, serendipitously, you know, I would say, because he thought he was going towards India, but there was somebody else at home, uh, a humanist scholar, Antonio Martinez de Nebrija, who with the sanction of the queen, that is Queen Isabella, who actually was ruling then uh, uh, Spain with a concert Ferdinand Isabella, standardizing the Castilian variety of old Spanish through the codification of its grammar and dictionary. Very interesting things about grammar and dictionary. These actually are very deeply politically, you know, engaged than one would perhaps think. Grammar and dictionary, a grammarian and a dictionary maker are very, very intensely uh, political people rather than apolitical as we might think they are. Okay, this attempt on the part of Nebriza, actually Nebriya was to, 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 to build up a regime of what is popularly uh, called as Armas Letras, you know, 
arms and letters for the queen to consolidate the linguistic space and the epistemic space of the, the empire than, you know, increasing military power. That's very interesting. We ought, the, the empire, go, be, you know, goes from strength to strength, not merely on the basis of its capital, not just on the basis of, um, you know, its maritime force or uh, the, the, the gun power. It also needs to consolidate itself from within and therefore you need a certain epistemic space that can be created through language and uh, you can have epistemological control. Actually, you know, if we have a certain language like the English language, which everybody knows about, and uh, um, English has so many varieties, everybody knows. Uh, well, it has, it has, a, it has a, it has a southern, a southern variety, a Yorkshire variety, uh, eastern variety. But why is it that a particular variety? which has now become the standard language that emerges you know only when the region where it is spoken becomes very politically important and london the midlands region that became very politically important that's the reason why uh, in course of time actually uh, this 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 variety of um, english became the standard language and that happens everywhere 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 um whereas from among the dialects existing dialects, one particular dialect emerges as, uh, you know, the standard language and that ultimately becomes the mother tongue. Well, it, so this Castilian, Castilian became the standard language and we know in Spain there are other languages or other dialects, you know, uh, other dialects like the Mas uh, Basques, for instance, the Basques have their own dialects and Basques have been fighting for, for you know cessation uh, from Spain for a long time and Catalan well two years ago we 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 witnessed rise of uh, uprising Catalan uprising the Catal the Catalanian people wanted to project their their own nationalism by 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 on the basis of their language and uh, uh, well, uh, that's that's very interesting, and I'll I'll tell you something. One of my scholars was working on Edward Hooper, the painter, you know, the painter, and uh, a certain poet, a Spanish poet, a Catal a Catalanian poet, actually uh, wrote a, a series of epigraphic poems on, on this painter's paintings, and uh, very interestingly, one of them most important uh, English translators, uh, actually he translated those those poems into English, you know, uh, that translator's uh, uh, name is just escaping, I'll, it will come to my mind and I'll, I'll be able to share with you who who translated that into English. Okay, if if anyone of you have read mm, nativizing English and foreignizing English, that particular translator is his his idea is ideas are known, uh, but the name somehow slips my memory. I'll, I'll I'll come back to it. Okay, what I'm trying to say is that this could only be possible. Could you please move on to the next slide? Yeah, it is the Queen's mother tongue. The Queen's language, that becomes the mother tongue. The Queen is the mother of the empire. So Castilian, one among the many uh, Spanish dialects was to be the standard language and taught as mother tongue. That's very important. Mother tongue is taught. Mother tongue is not something that we imbibe uh, like mother's milk, although we do have plenty of such, you know, sentimental discourse uh, about uh, matru stanyo, matru uh, dubdha and matru hasha and things like that. But it, these are two completely different concepts altogether. After all, it's the Supreme Mother, the Queen's language, and we are familiar with the Queen's English, you know, our teachers actually uh, tweak our ears if we fail to. Well, I have been a product of that. That's why I've 
picked up quite a bit of this Queen's English, and we all are familiar with Queen's in English, one of the important imperial myths to epistemologically control the colonies. And we know how among the English commodities, well, um, the, their language is so still very popular. It is still selling, um, you know, so very well in the um, post-colonial cultural economy. We keep on translating our stuff into English as well. Okay, so that's what it is, please. The next slide. Uh, okay, I'll be I'll be talking about this a little later. How this linguistic shift from orality to literacy took place, and uh, uh, in correspondence with that, from Koili or Bangla Koil, Tadbhava, and you know they they took a shift towards Kokila or Bangla Kokil. You know, it's a Tatsama word, and this shift was part of the uh, development of what we call the mother tongue. Okay. Um, in the context of, so, uh, mention may be made that vis-a-vis -vis the English language in the colonial context, the term vernacular did not exactly signify the same idea as I told you, the idea of a homegrown product. Um, as far as Odia uh, mother tongue is concerned, actually, I would like to uh, uh, frame it within a certain historical context of, uh, you know, uh, late 19th and uh, 20th, uh, uh, early 20th century, Odia nationalism, cultural nationalism vis-a-vis -vis Bengali, you know, and the rise of the Odia mother tongue in the late 19th and early 20th centuries in the context of Odia linguistic and uh, cultural nationalism is a very well documented and cultural narrative. And what underlies this is the formation of the English educated colonial in, uh, you know, Odia elite that invoked the, the, the notion of linguistic purity for Odia, not only to mark it up from Bengali or from Telugu, but also uh, to differentiate it, you know, from the non-standard, you know, colloquial Odia. So, you know, this whole idea of the construction of the mother tongue is invaded in um, a very, uh, very complex uh, uh, cultural politics of identity of a colonial bourgeoisie. I mean, colonial uh, Western educated bourgeoisie. That's what it is all about. Well, the strategy worked quite well uh, for the cultural empowerment, to be educated, to be credited with literary and intellectual values, and to be invested with uh, the colonial administrative power. Education was a privilege. Uh, well, in a uh, in a in a in a in a in a, in a, uh, in a very impassioned editorial that uh, Bishwanath Kaur and Bishwanath Kaur in Bangla, Bishwanath, but his Odia. This is the title that we share, just as my title is shared with Bengalis as well. Um, Panda, Misra, Jena, you know, all these are shared between Bengalis and Odia. So Bishwanath Kaur, we call it, and in Bangla it's Bishwanath Kaur. Okay, whatever he wrote. Uh, in 1900, at the turn of the 19th century, um, in his Utkal Sahitya, could you please move on to the next one? And we'll just look at this here. Yeah. Editorial, Bividha Prashongo, you know, miscellany of topics. Actually, he wrote in earlier, and I've translated uh, this passage into English. People in this region harbor a wrong notion that one should not labor to teach Uriya which is, after all, our mother tongue. He is precisely, you know, talking on this point. This is preposterous. If learning to read and write Odia were enough, all native speakers of Odia would be considered experts in the language. Uh, however, the way Odia is being abused in the Kacheri or Jamindas office, as if it is, uh, yeah, um, as if it is, it is, it, well, Amit, would you like to interrupt me and say something? Because your mic is torn on, that's why, perhaps. No, no, it's, um, it's all right. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. Yeah, so, however, Odia is being abused in the Kacheri 
or Jamindar's office as if it is free for all and the aforesaid nation notion seems quite natural. And in our opinion, he emphasizes primary education should be imparted in Oriya and the mother tongue learning should never be dispensed with till, uh, you know, till the upper classes. Now look at this very clearly. He emphasizes the whole idea of mother tongue should be taught in school as part of formal education and also while um, very interestingly I would like to make a digression here we all uh, call our uh, uh, colleges and universities or schools from where we graduated we call it alma mater Mm, but um, probably we don't don't understand how this alma mater, this whole idea. Actually, there is a slide there. Could you please move on to that? Uh, yeah, that's right. Probing the mother, commodifying the mother tongue. That's my point. The phrase alma mater, which means the nourishing mother. Alma, nourishing. The mother, mother means schools, colleges, and universities where we were educated. Well, but we know physical nourishment comes as milk from the mother, and intellectual nourishment comes as education from school. Therefore, school becomes a surrogate for the mother, and the mother tongue actually is a formally learned for a price, although we don't uh, pay any price to the mother. Uh, whose uh, milk we drink, you know, mother's milk is free, but <laughs> not the mother's, not the mother tongue. Although we know how to camouflage the uh, unpalatable uh, economic and political side of mother tongue, and you know, we walk eloquent in very sentimental mode as to how keep up it through. Say Matu Hasa, Matu Stanya, Jari Jari Jetavari, Monisoko Polipustokorai, say he will, but I had that Miko, sorry, got a Bautico story, Moniso, say to nourishment by and things like that. Okay, that's that's the point which I want you to make. Now, uh, this one more slide I'll talk to you about, and please move on. Next, next one. Mother tongue fortified with culture and learning. In fact, in an essay at, at the end of the 19th century called Jatiyo Sahitya, National Literature uh, in Utkal Sahitya, Sadashiv Vidyabhushan had opined, only when poets and authors of Utkal themselves embody moral values and write books of learning in a cultivated, tasteful style and draw upon Sanskrit and English tones of learning through translation, then only will they enrich their mother tongue and literature of Utkal acquire a celestial aura of its own. Okay, so uh, this uh, actually uh, is a very interesting uh, uh, comment by uh, by him, and uh, uh, this one more comment also by uh, Mrityunja Ratha, who was actually a dictionary maker who actually said something in, uh, uh, he gave a speech at Kotak Debating Society in 1904, and he said that, well, the piety's customs and manners, you know, uh, of language of the village people are looked down upon as inferior, although the pure, pristine, although pure and pristine, they distinctly lack the ideas mediated by education, the language of townsmen may be confronted and contaminated on all fronts, but the tongue of the villagers face no opposition as it has natural modes and sentiments intact, and although the villagers' tongue is inferior, certain aspects of it are nevertheless has their own merit. This is the same ambiguous uh, idea of uh, what the common man's language is when we remember Wordsworth, you know. We, everybody knows what an ambiguous attitude Wordsworth had towards the common man's language which he wanted to capitalize. Well, that common man's language was hardly, hardly the colloquial rustic language that we, uh, you know, find. At least some of the 
rural characters of Thomas Hardy speak. I mean, that's not the language. And why is it that? Well, these uh, romantics actually, or Wordsworth in particular, and also Coleridge to some extent, they were they were developing this idea of a mother tongue, and you know, it has something to do with the larger larger uh, politics of cultural nationalism. Uh, Britain was emerging as a, uh, an empire no longer no well um, um, that 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 uh, that phase of uh, uh, French uh, revolution was over while well, Napoleon of course was there you know uh, to to threaten but Napoleon in course of time after the Battle of Waterloo actually that was the end of Nepo uh, Napoleon's era and Britain emerged almost unchallenged as the you know most important colonial power uh, in, in 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 the in the 19th century at least from the um, from that Battle of Waterloo onwards 1815 onwards uh, until perhaps uh, you know um, well, the, the the second world I'm sorry the first world war or or to be very precise, as far as Indian colonialism in India is concerned, then the turning point is past 1919. Yes, of course, with the outbreak of the First World War. Whatever, you know, what happens here is this whole idea of uh, uh, translation becomes very important and the mother tongue actually is, uh, 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 you know, enriched by the other culturally powerful languages through translation. In fact, if we look at um, the uh, modern European languages, all these have evolved through translation in a big way. Therefore, translation uh, actually has a, a, a enormous cultural role towards enriching and fortifying uh, the mother tongue. You know. uh, in this context, therefore, Orissa has a very peculiar kind of a history, as you know, Orissa is one of the very few states in India which didn't have a distinct political identity of its own. There were many Odia speaking tracts, you know, merged with different, uh, 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 different uh, uh, presidencies, the Southern Presidency and Bengal Presidency. And uh, then, of course, Orissa was created again. It had the same uh, assembly, Bihar Orissa Legislative Assembly. And Orissa really didn't have a political identity of its own. Therefore, it remained submerged culturally, you know, with the other languages. And, you know, it had to fight a very, uh, very intense battle with Bengali and with, with uh, Telugu and uh, Tamil. And uh, therefore, on one of the most important agendas was the unification of the Odia speaking tracts, which took place in 1936. And Odisha is the only state, perhaps the first and the only state in India to have been formed on its, you know, its political boundaries match, its uh, linguistic boundaries, and it's the first state to have been formed on the basis of the unification, uh, on the unity of language. It is a linguistically, you know, constructed state which didn't have uh, a political identity of its own. Therefore, high stakes were involved for the unification of Orissa. Very interesting what happens when a, a consolidation of an empire or a nascent state takes place. A dictionary plays a major role that has been proved by history, you know, whether it is uh, Italy, uh, the unification of Italy. Yeah, please hold on to that. Uh, please hold on to that. Yeah, uh, whether it's Ital uh, you know unification of Italy or um, uh, the, 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 you know, uh, about Spain we were talking about. Italy too had no uh, unity of its own, but in Novo Dizonario, a new dictionary was, was, was once again, uh, it was during the time of, uh, uh, it was during the time of Bismarck that the unification of Germany took place, and, and also at the same time, you know, Italy, an Italian dictionary came out. Very interestingly, when uh, the uh, 
the the two Germanys, you know, that belong to two different uh, 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 political ideologies that believe in two different political ideologies and two different countries with that Brandenburg Wall separating them. They were speaking, speaking the same language, you know, but they had two dictionaries, different dictionaries. Is German dictionary, which is very different from the West German dictionary, when this wall collapsed and the unification of the, the Germanys took place, well, uh, only one dictionary that came into contact, you know, this happens. I mean, dictionary once again is very deeply, deeply in, uh, intertwined with the fate of an empire or a state. And this particular dictionary uh, uh, could be we'll move on to uh, the next one, Gaurav. This Purnachandra Oriya Bhasa Kos, a mammoth dictionary from 1929 to 1940, 17 volumes by. Um, by Gopal Chandra Prahraj. Um, it was a dictionary impelled by what I call the translational consciousness dedicated to the cause of the creation of the mother tongue on which the possibility of the unification of Odia, Odisha rested and it needed the colonial mentorship and support. That's very important because Odia culture nationalism was mediated and supported by colonial power structure. And uh, it was W.W. Uh, w. Henderson, uh, the principal of Kotak Training College, 1314, well, and the Vernacular Development Committee, uh, which thought of this, and this dictionary was to be published, and the project took off with the patronage and of the government. So please move on to the next one. Yeah. Could you please move on to the next one? Yeah, that's it. Now, yeah, I want to approach this construction here yeah, as a, no, the previous one, I think you skipped, you moved on to this, but I want just, uh, not this, just the previous one. Yes, Odia poems of Koili Zondra. You know, I want to say that the Odia language was a vernacular then in the sense of Ivan Illich. And here you have a Zondra of a Koili poem in the 15th and the 17th century. In fact, the richness of Odia medieval poetry is, uh, is amazing. And here we find Keshav Koili, for instance, that the cuckoo is addressed by a tearful Yashoda as a messenger to carry the message of her sorrowful state to Keshava, who has left for Mathura, but he hasn't returned yet. And there are some other cuckoo poems by Jagannath Dasa, that is Artha Koeli, that is the meaning of Koeli as revealed, and Lokunath Dasa, that is Gyanodaya Koeli, or Vairaga Dasa, Sisubheda Koeli, you know, all these are of poems of the 16th and the 17th century, which have a very, very deep philosophical meaning. Well, Koeli, you know, variously meant in those days in this genre, it could be a messenger, it could be Jiva or Prana or the ignorant, unenlightened self searching for supreme knowledge and so on. Actually, uh, this genre itself was enriched by the Vaishnava and Buddhist philosophy uh, Vaishnava tradition was was so very 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 vibrant in Bengal. We know, uh, and uh, there were different forms: Jyotisha and Charyapada. Charyapada is once again a form that we share with Bengal. It's not just Rasagulla which unites us, or Rasagulla over which we fight, but Charyapada once again becomes a, a point of scholarly debate as to whom it belongs. Well, it belongs to both. Let's not fight over that or Bhagavata for that. For that matter, you know, these actually, uh, what is important here is that I don't wish to talk about uh, the literary uh, uh, meaning or the qualities. What I want to say is that uh, these were part of an oral, oral uh, literature which uh, and, and which employed this koili, which is a desaja, uh, uh, demotic. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and also there were some Tad Baba words there, but these Sanskritized 
that some addiction actually came much later to Odia poetry and that came only in the 19th century through, through the translation of English poems. Let's move on to the next one. Now from Koili, we move on to Kokila, as reinvented as Koili. Kokila was reinvented with, in the poetic vocabulary with the new inflections when Uriya educated, uh, English educated Uriya natives like Nandakishore Ball. There were many, in fact. We do find uh, whom we call the Uriya modern poets actually are, well, Radhanath Rai and uh, Madhusudan uh, Rao, then Nandakishore Ball, uh, Mohini Mohan Dei, and um, well, quite a few people, they were translating uh, from, from, from uh, English into Oriya. And this, this, this John Logan's the cuckoo and worse was cuckoo, there he doesn't or use the word coily. And why not? What's wrong with that? Well, it becomes cochila prati, cochila, which carried the semantic baggage of highly valorized English and Oriyan poetry. And uh, both poems were published in Utkal Sahitya in 1901. It was about the time when these people were writing essays, talking about how mother tongue should be taught in schools. And there is a tendency, what once it becomes a kind of a language to be sold as a commodity, it has to be Sanskritized, you know, as much as it has to be slightly anglicized. That's the point, you know. Um, so Kokila was not a tats, it was not just a tatsama word with conventional figurative, a new poetic trope carrying suggestions and valency of you know, mystic, nominal, transcendent and immortal as opposed to that quotidian and mortal. And it became the marker of uh, 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 literary modernity as well as mother tongue literacy. Uh, well, these are points. Um, then perhaps we may move on to the next one, you know, and uh, yeah, so many instances, just look at the number, Bonapriya, written by Nanda Kishore, then you have in Prabhasi, uh, the same Nanda Kishore writing, and Dinabandhu Mohanti was writing, and Upendra Kishore Mohanti writing, Basanta, Kokilapati, all these are, you know, actually, I wouldn't even call translations, they were what you might call transcreation or adaptations, and I have, I have a few uh, interesting comments to offer on this uh, whole idea of adaptation. Please move on to the next one. Uh, translation, adaptation, purposes, implications, if that's what uh, I, I wish to talk about, then translation, you know, they can be literary and non-literary, non-literary uh, translations may have the purpose of scholarly desire for knowledge from foreign language source, particularly in uh, various uh, knowledge fields. Um, it, it may have the purpose of trade and commerce with foreigners and administration of natives as, as in the colonial times, and translation operates uh, in matters of, in matrices of power structures as scholarship, scholarship trade and politics. But literary uh, translation has uh, some some different set of purposes. One is integrated to access to world literature. While well, many of us have been reading world literature through translation, and uh, there could as well be a nationalist uh, kind of uh, sentiment attached to translation when you, we want to uh, translate into Bangla the very best of uh, works written in French. Or, or, or Greek, you know, very interestingly, once again, if we look at some of the publications at Jadavpur, Department of Comparative Literature, they have a wonderful collection. Um, I think uh, Professor Uma Chakravarti was working on the reception of European, uh, you know, texts. And uh, in Bangla, actually, they were translated, people read them in Bangla translation and so on and so forth. That's a nationalist. And also, as I told you in my in my discussion, this dictionary, this dictionary very interestingly, not merely was it an Odia to Odia dictionary where you have find you have you have Odia words and Odia definitions and meanings, but also synonyms in Hindi, 
English and Bangla. That's very important. So, in fact, it is an Odia too, Odia dictionary at one level, and also with synonyms in Bangla, or um, uh, English and Hindi. In other words, it was an attempt on the part of uh, uh, Prohoras to locate this 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 uh, language in the cultural map of India. And uh, it was also very nationalist, once again, to, to show to the others how rich we are in vocabulary, in our literary and cultural resources. We are not poor or we illiterate as some, you know, vested uh, group of Bengalis, you know, uh, made uh, the Odias uh, uh, to look like. But this was some kind of a uh, protest against uh, this very poor cultural image perpetrated by the Bengali elite of uh, that period. And uh, another purpose is very adaptive to adapt a literary genre for enrichment of native literature and native literary language and culture. Yeah, please, the next one. Adaptation and Odia mother tongue. Adaptation is a creative sort of translation. Some people call it transcreation. It is a, the opposite uh, end of uh, literary translation ac across, mm, literal translation across the translational spectrum. And it grants autonomy to the native writer and poet. And they reanimate the indigenous semantic resources and, and expressive modes. Look at all these uh, modern forms. Look at, I mean, uh, 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 Michael Madhusudan, the great uh, uh, literateur of the 19th century, who introduced the blank verse, uh, who introduced sonnet, a great uh, who introduced to Bengali literature the idiom of drama, for instance, and who translated Meghnath, Badha, and you know, uh, many such brilliant works. All these uh, actually lyrics, sonnets, odes, mil you know, particularly Miltonic epics, not Homeric, but Miltonic epics have been have been part of our our own literary genres through through adaptation to build up the cultural consciousness of the native bourgeoisie who energize the mother tongue. We owe it to them, the native elite bourgeoisie. Yeah, and this is a benefit that have been accrued to all languages. Is, uh, uh, native elite bourgeoisie. They may have their own cultural politics, but they ended up uh, enriching the language in their own way. We think of Bankim Chandra, you know, mm, in a way one can say it is with Bankim that the modern uh, Bangla prose emerged, and Bankim had such such a wonderful uh, contribution to the making of modern Bangla prose through his through his uh, fiction, through his uh, you know, polemical writings and essays, come to think of that, and Bunkim, who can be a more ambiguous or ambiguously positioned uh, 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 native uh, uh, English educated uh, uh, person uh, who could be more, 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 more ambiguously positioned than him. That's, that's the point. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Uh, so the pre-colonial times, yeah, vernaculars and colonial times, modern tongue, I take this uh, uh, book, Selden Pollock's Language of the Gods in the Worlds of Men, Sanskrit, Culture and Power in Pre-Modern Times. Well, Pollock already had developed literary vernacular around mid-15th century with Karla Das's adaptation of Mahabharata and Balaram Das's adaptation of Ramayana. This is very interesting. They were adapting from Sanskrit in order to develop the pre-colonial language, which was a vernacular. Vernacular, in the sense it is vernaculum, it was homegrown. So adaptations have been part of our translation strategy. Mother tongue actually is a typically colonial product through the same translational consciousness, 
uh, through this through various strategies uh, about purity and uh, kind of on uh, purity cultural purity as well as balance of uh, a western educated uh, portolog or you know ed western educated elite who actually was trying to energize their mother tongue through their own uh, linguistic uh, uh, as well as uh, cultural strategies um want to do well to my mind actually uh, to rethink this issue of mother tongue in the literary context which is usually overlooked by uh, the, the 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 you know linguist and and uh, uh, explore uh, uh, in greater depths in greater depths of uh, the cultural logic of translation underlying mother tongue at least in the colonial times this is something that needs to be actually worked upon in a more serious way thank you uh, professor vadacharya for and, and and the audience uh, for patiently you know sitting through this lecture which might have uh, sounded a bit too tedious uh, but then yeah thank you well we well i want to thank professor mahapatra for such a wonderful presentation and we are doubly delighted to have him discuss this particular point because today happens to be the birth anniversary of william carey yes 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 and you know we we all know his great work pioneering work in promoting and also standardizing yes. bengali language yes yes and that that was also in the colonial period indeed indeed so it's it's really a glorious coincidence that mm -hmm. today we are really discussing this particular yes. point yes. the bangla so, drama nathaniel brashi halhed you know that, that yes. drama that came out from you know sirampur mission Yes. Um, uh, yes, yes. Yes. So, yes. It's my privilege now to throw open this session for comments and queries from the attendees, the audience, and Professor Mohapatra. I am sure will be very happy to answer your questions yes. or to yes. discuss your observations. Yes. 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 Uh, should I read the question to Professor Mohapatra, sir? Yes, you. Can, yeah, you can do that. Ah yeah. uh, yes. Uh, so uh, here we are getting the first question from Adnan Asraf, sir, okay. and he is asking: uh, You talked about the introduction of foreign genres to the indigenous people in terms of power. How about the introduction of ghazal to American literature by Aga Said Ali? and adab just has me i know of some people writing very good ghazals in english yeah in fact it's a genre which actually has caught the fancy of uh, the american uh, uh, some of the american poets are yeah it's no what i'm trying to say is that i merely discussed uh, you know culture and its configurations in the colonial context that however doesn't mean that uh, there are not other possibilities other directions and other destinies as you know actually culture cannot be policed in any way and particularly in the post colonial times uh, uh, considering globalization uh as a as a as a condition of uh, uh, unfolding of a free space at least for the transfer of culture not human beings but transfer of cultures uh well culture has migrated and culture as you know uh itself if we look at uh, uh, um, uh its its history it has never remained static it has always uh, taken not just taken roots it has also it has not just taken or it has not just stricken roots r w o t s it has also taken various roots r o u t e s it is always uh, all about, you know overflowing and it's good i mean that uh, that well uh, i guess i guess uh, 
Ghazal is a, a contribution, a solid contribution to our literature. And uh, uh, it's a um, good fortune that once again through English it becomes visible as a brilliant poetry form. Yeah. So, uh, we are yet to receive the next one, sir. Yes. Uh, if anyone wants to ask any question, he or she can go forward. We'll read out questions from the chat box, obviously. New educational policy in the fetish of mother tongue as a medium. Well, <laughs> I would, I would not, I would not endorse the idea of calling it a fetish. I believe the mother tongue is very important. Why it would be not? Because uh, if we, uh, well, uh, many cognitive uh, 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 psychologists and educationists believe that mother tongue is the best medium in which arithmetic should be taught. And um, the very best of people actually, I, I actually, I would say that I'm pretty much a mother tongue person. I mean, English came to me much later. I, I don't claim that. Um, so uh, what is wrong? Why shouldn't mother tongue be the uh, medium of instruction? I guess some very best of people have taught us this. I wouldn't call it a fetish. In fact, I take exception to that kind of... No, nobody is fetishizing the mother tongue. It is pretty much there whether we like it or not. You know, it's, it's part of... And it, it, it's, it's so very crucial for our cognitive development of our affective development, our, uh, you know, emotional and uh, psychological uh, well-being. We depend on it. Yeah. But mother tongue is once again very, 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 uh, very. Uh, it's mother tongue is not the mother's tongue. It's not necessarily the language that the mother speaks. You know, because the it may so happen that the language that the mother speaks to the child may not be her mother tongue. Also, that's another side of mother tongue, which Devi Prasanna Devi Patnaik, D.P. Patnaik actually has uh, worked on this, the whole idea of mother tongue as a chimera, you know. Uh, any language that is your primary language, that's a functional term, that becomes the mother tongue. Anyway, yeah, so that's that's it. Yeah, so like as a way of marking what? As a way of, I couldn't read the whole of uh, that, uh, um, that, that, that question. Mother tongue as a way of marking what? I mean, please type it out clearly so that I, I'll be able to answer that question. Anyway, any any other question or the same question? Could could you please read out to me, Gaurav? Okay, uh, we are getting one question from Rina Muitro, sir. Okay. Uh, categorically distinguish between the vernacular and the mother tongue. Hmm. This is mm -hmm. Well, well, actually, as I told ma'am, um, vernacular, this word came into uses during the colonial times. The tongues of the you know, natives was called uh, uh, the vernacular. And this whole idea of anglicists versus vernacularists, as you know, actually has been part of the cultural history of, um, or linguistic history, uh, linguistic history of Indian language, or history of Indian languages in, 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 in the colonial times, the Woods Dispatch, for instance, or the policies of, uh, um, you know, uh, like uh, Professor Vadachari was telling us about uh, uh, John Kerry and his uh, um, Bengal Baptist mission at Sirampur. It was during the time of uh, uh, Warden Hastings who actually referred that, well, okay, the native's language should be taught for strategic reasons. So that was the usage. But then uh, in 
in, in our day to day life these days we don't talk about bengali vernacular or maybe when we talk about schooling system okay it comes from the vernacular schooling system which is once again a colonial hangover but i was trying to differentiate uh, between them particularly uh, with regard to um, their ontology with regard to the way they have been constructed actually the basic point is ivan elich who says that vernacular is part of a pre uh, capitalist subsistence economy whereas mother tongue especially is uh, a, 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 an idea that took shape during the colonial times during the rise of the modern state modern nation state it is a distinctly it is a distinctly well it is a distinctly uh, modern phenomenon a capitalist phenomenon it is only in order to understand mother tongue as to what it is we need to well uh, differentiate it from what existed earlier and that's what i call the vernacular is only for my own strategic uh, reasons I did that. So, yes, sir. Uh, next question is from Deepshika Behra, sir. Achha. And she uh, wants to know your thoughts on the importance of mother tongue as a way of marking differences in cross cultural encounters in the debate on un untranslat sorry, untranslatability. Can it be seen as a way of resistance to the appropriation that presumed in the act of translation? Um, I guess uh, the question uh, should have been a little short and uh, well structured, but I, I guess I understand the question. The question is uh, uh, the problem of un untranslatability in uh, any translation and whether this untranslatability itself is a challenge to the author to the hegemony of english is that is that the question is untranslated okay it is untranslatability itself well i don't think so because any act of translation always uh, uh, encounters this problem of uh, 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 you know uh, untranslatability for the simple reason that languages do not operate in space um, mother tongue as a mode of resistance well yes in certain ways let me let me first take that well if we if we think of uh, ngugi what uh, you know in ngugi what yongo uh, 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 kenya he also took a very uh, very 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 deep the, de-englishing the schools the you know in in kenya and he he was very polemical uh in the uh, mid 60s i mean he he wanted uh, uh and he he wrote a, a, a play in his own language kikuyu language uh Engahika. i'm sorry Yes, Matik Matigari, and 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 also, and, and, and I remember the title, Engahika Endina, you know. Yes. You, <laughs> and he said, I, 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 I will marry when I choose to. That's that's the English. Yeah, I mean, that was also a program. Uh, that has been a program with so, so many African writers, and that's also the reason why. I mean. Uh, Ngugi got into some kind of a controversy with uh, with uh, I think uh, it was Chinua Chibi in Chinua yeah, Chibi. Chibi. Yeah, yeah. This this debate goes on, but but the point is uh, to come back to the first question. Uh, untranslatability is inevitably a problem that translation has to encounter for the simple reason that every language is uh, culturally. Uh, encoded uh, it comes as a package so there are certain terms and expressions which are very culture specific and uh, while we are translating in fact we are negotiating with another language like cross culture times it becomes very difficult to actually find an exact equivalent uh, for uh, a language in the other language so it's it's always a problem yeah but mother tongue at times has been yes as i gave you the example of 
um, uh, Ngugi Wa Thiongo uh, is, a, is a very brilliant example of, uh, you know, such kind of a resistance against what he believed uh, was the colonial hegemony of English. Yeah. Next, uh, we are getting a long question from Ojoy Deep, sir. And uh, he's asking, a certain writer may be very important in his or her own language, but may not be translated or translatable at all. A good yes. example until recently was uh, Valachandra Nemade. Recently, yeah. Masculine India published Shudhakar Marathe's translation of his first novel, Kosla. Kosla, Kosla. Of the and translation let, yes, must yes. suffer from this disadvantage that the availability of translation, sometimes mm. translated text too, can contribute to this unhappy illusion that English equals Indian. Your thought on this, sir? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> In fact, Professor, Professor Valachandra Nemade was a visiting scholar at uh, Sambalpur well, sometime in mid 80s and it was during his stay that he was writing this this wonderful uh, novel uh, Koshla and uh, it was of course later translated. I, I distinctly remember you would be in the case house writing this and uh, asking for innumerable cups of tea if the guests, the other guests, you know, got into a conversation at a louder voice and this old man, the grumpy old man in fact shouted at them, can't you see I'm writing something and you guys are disturbing me so I, <laughs> I have been privy to this interesting thing. Okay, that having said that, I would like to uh, take this question. Uh, you you mean to say that? Uh, let me first uh, be very clear about what you want to know exactly, because your question hasn't been mm, very clear. Or do you mean to say that at times a, a translation can also be a resistant translation? Do you mean to say that? Is that the question? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, Ajay Deep. All right. Yeah, the point is translation can be at times very reader friendly and to that extent very transparent. Right. And the translation can also be at times very resistant and very opaque. Well, the, oh, well, now that linguist's uh, name comes to my mind, that's Charles Benuti. Benuti, who, who also does talk about this, I mean, transparency and opacity, um, to be reader friendly and to be resistant. Well, it depends on the text that we are translating. In fact, uh, no translator, good translator adopts one single strategy. It all depends on the kind of test, uh, text. For instance, a certain text which actually is uh, perhaps, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 very hegemonic in its intent, then the best way perhaps to uh, deconstruct its hegemony, to unravel its agenda is to produce a resistant translation. But a text, let's say a very important uh, text on thermodynamics, on any non-literary uh, work, then we must actually make uh, the translation as, uh, as, as transparent as possible, you know. The Bible translation, for instance, used to be very transparent. You know, St. Jerome, as you know, is one of the important, uh, important uh, Bible translators and St. Jerome believed that the translator should be invisible. But some people say the translator ought to be visible. You know, a very resistant kind of translation is necessary. But why is it that? Some, some authors are very happy with their translation. Uh, take, for instance, uh, the, the translations of uh, the, um, the works of uh, the great uh, uh, you know, <coughs> Colombian writer, um, 100 Years of Solitude, oh, uh, the Colombian writer. Gabriel Garcia Marquez. 
you know, Marquez, Marquez, what happens to me these days at times, you know, those, those names keep on, you know, <laughs> eliding my memory. Anyway, the Marquez, look at the Marquez uh, translations by Gregory Rabassa. Marquez himself says, well, nobody could have done the translations as beautifully as uh, Gregory Rabassa. There are a couple of uh, books, I guess, which have been translated by Edith Grossman, but Greg, I mean, as, as far as uh, uh, Marquez is concerned, I, uh, uh, Gregory Rabassa is uh, the most faithful translator and perhaps a kind of a transparent translator. And uh, we have been reading these books. These books have been published, not any other translation, for the simple reason that, well, we need to understand uh, the Latin American revolution and it's very politically important for us because this is a brilliant work against El, uh, 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 against uh, uh, neo-imperialism, uh, American neo-imperialism and, and things like that. Therefore, we need to have, you know, very transparent kind of, we ought to know, we ought to know what he is saying because that's very important for us. So then, of course, we would have a very, you know, uh, very, 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 uh, a transparent kind of a translation. In fact, it's a very, very interesting area. One can go on talking about different kinds of translations. Of Law, Leo Tolstoy, for instance, or or or, or the translations of um, the other Russian great, that is Dostoevsky, you know, Constance Garnett, and the other translators. New translations of uh, War and Peace came out only two years ago, and it has a different take altogether. To some extent, it is it is opaque. So these questions are these these go on. You know, yeah, right. Any other questions? Uh, I, no, there are no more questions. Sir. No. Well, uh, every good thing must come to an end. So it now remains for me to sum up the session with my closing comments. Uh, we have had a brilliant presentation by Professor Ashokya Mahapatra, followed by a Q&A session that was equally vibrant. And I must thank not only the speaker for the session, but also the August audience, whose questions have really enlightened us all and given Professor Mahapatra to share some of his ideas in course of the interactive session. Thank you. I think today questions have been raised and answers have been hazarded. <laughs> but it only remains for us to remember and recalibrate the whole process of translation, whereby vernaculars were transformed into mother tongues. Because, you know, the colonial period produced its own westernized elite who tried to, in their own complex ideological way, they wanted to not only enrich their languages, their first language, if we may call it in a neutral way, by taking in certain issues and aspects of the colonizer's speech, but also reviving certain hidden and half-remembered aspects of their own language. And the construction of this mother tongue was not only a pan-Indian process, it actually had both Western elements and indigenous elements. Right. So we have to think what is the ideological journey that has been traversed when we come from Bonjo to Prabharaj, from Radhakanto Dev to Raja Ram Mohan Roy and the debate 
and the discussion will go on yes so with this we come to the end of today's session